All right, happy Thursday, Grass GIS practicum, everybody. Uh, we're going to move on, basically uh, building off what we did last week. We're starting again, working in grass. And uh, last week we did terrain analysis, and this week we're going to do least cost path analysis. And then we're going to throw in a little bit of vector querying and SQL database querying uh, so that we can query raster maps at the location of specific vector points. So we're dealing with uh, Project 2 data. We're in the Wadi Hassa region of South Central Jordan and we have our two site databases, our Wadi Hassa Survey, WHS, and our Wadi Hassa North Bank Survey. So let's just load in our base data. We have a raster map. I'm clicking the display rast, uh, raster map button and I'm getting my DRAST module. And we have all the maps we made last time, but let's just load up our SRTM base DM, which if you'll recall, we're in map set project two. The base data should live in permanent so we don't accidentally delete it uh, or modify it. And everything we do in grass from here on out, remember, is pretty much gonna create a derivative product, a second map, uh, a map that's created out of our base data. So we're just going to display that one, like so, and we can see our DEM over there. And why not, at this time, also put on our two site uh, database vector points maps. So Wadi Hassa sites, WHS sites. Um, and let's go ahead and quickly just change the color to be red. Uh, click OK to add them. And then we'll go add another vector points map, and we'll add our WHNBS sites and we'll change that color to be blue and click OK. And so that shows us our two archaeological surveys uh, and all the points, all the archaeological sites they found as basically uh, single points GPS coordinates in the center of those sites. So I did show you before how we could grow buffers of a particular size around the, those sites. And we did that by uh, essentially pulling in some information from the tables that are associated with those sites. We looked at the maximum length or width uh, to do that. And uh, so you could continue to use your buffers if you wanted to query some of these uh, you know, pieces of information within the boundaries or the radius of the site size. But for making things a little easier, what I'm going to do is just go forth with today's practicum uh, using the point location. So all the querying that we're going to do is going to happen at the one GPS point, you know, right in the center of the site, hopefully, uh, where the point was actually recorded. So we'll just keep that in mind. So we're going to look at everything as vector points, but we could do this as areas, the sort of polygons that are created from the buffers. So uh, before we get into vector querying, what I want to do is to um, talk about um, least cost path analysis. And we had a conversation about that in class on Tuesday. Uh, and we talked about the couple of different approaches for doing least cost path. And in grass, I just want to show you where those live. They're all raster modules. And they live mostly in the terrain analysis um, tool. So we have basically three tools that we're gonna uh, that you could potentially use. Our cost is for isotropic cost surface generation, uh, basically where you input the friction costs, and doesn't matter which direction, upslope, downslope, east, west, north, south, that you're crossing that particular raster cell, that's the cost of walking across it. Uh, we have our walk, which uses a specific formula of the efficiency of walking up or down slope or on flat land and so it creates an anisotropic cost surface. Basically it matters where you start and which direction you start walking from. And then we have our drain which lets you take the output of these guys uh, and create actual cost paths, actual lines that you know one would walk along the path of least resistance. So we could explore cost, our cost, uh, but I think probably for most of what we want to do in archaeology, we, we're interested in human walking. Not always, but we are. 
generally speaking. So we're going to work with our walk uh, for now. Now, just running you through this, you basically need to input an elevation map. You know, your SRTM is fine. You need a map of friction costs, and these are additional costs to just the cost of walking across the slopes in the various direction. Um, and this could really be related to vegetation, or it could be, um, you know, cultural reasons for making it difficult to go in one place or another. The simplest thing to do is to say we're just going to care about the uh, slope, so we'll make a friction cost of zero or one. These are additional seconds of walking time it would take to cross that particular cell. Now, if we don't have any reason to add additional costs, we shouldn't do that. So as long as we make a basically a blank map or a map of all one value, the output is going to be basically the same. And there's an output map. And then um, you can get an optional output map of the actual direction that would have been taken. That can be useful in certain circumstances. Um, and then finally, you just need to tell it where to start and potentially where to stop. And here's where we have to be a little bit creative, okay? So ostensibly, we're going to want to figure out the cost of walking from one place to another place. And that could be between one site and another site, uh, and it could be between walking between a set of sites and a suite of landscape features. So if we wanted to figure out how long it would take to walk from one site to another site, we would start the cost uh, uh, our walk cost surface generation routine at site A, wait for it to finish, then load up the cost surface, the resulting cost surface of walking away from site A, and query at the location of site B, and that would give us the number of seconds that it would take to walk along that path of least resistance. Now that would be something that's potentially useful. We could certainly do that. But for the purposes of our class, because we're going to be building, we're working towards building a predictive model, what we want to do in this particular case is to figure out how long it would take to walk from any site, any known archaeological site, to the nearest stream. Right? And it could be other nearest features, it could be the nearest uh, ridges or the nearest roads or anything like that, but remember in the last uh, practicum we actually extracted a network of streams. So, and that's potentially a very useful piece of information. How long does it take to walk to the nearest stream from all the sites that we're interested in? So, if you're thinking about this, the way we just said, where you start at the site and you walk away from the site to the stream, that becomes kind of hard when you've got, you know, potentially a thousand or more sites. You'd have to do a cost surface for every single site. You know, 1,000 cost surfaces is going to take a long time for the computer to work out. The other thing that you can do, though, is to flip that and say, let's start walking from all the streams and create a cost surface of walking from all points along the stream away from the streams. And then later on, we can query at the location of all the sites, and we get the time it took to walk from the stream to the site. Now, remembering that we're working with an anisotropic cost surface, that time may be slightly different than walking from the site backwards, but it will be reasonably close. At least it will give us an estimate, because typically you can imagine it will be a round trip from the site to the stream, from the stream back to the site. So at least knowing half of that leg will give us some way to estimate uh, whether or not uh, the site is uh, a reasonable walking distance from the stream or not. And that's a useful thing to know for human behavior because, well, maybe people put their sites where they are because they needed to access fresh water. And if they didn't put the sites near the streams, then there may be other important reasons, cultural reasons for doing so. Maybe they needed to put their sites up high on mountaintops for defensive purposes. And what we're doing is allowing ourselves to test that hypothesis simply by querying uh, you know, a reasonable estimate of walking costs to and from those streams. So enough yammering. Let's talk about how we actually do that. So the very first thing that we need to do in order to use our walk or even our cost is to create that friction map. So, we're going to create a real simple one, and we're going to use the raster map calculator, which we haven't talked about yet. And we'll talk about more when we get into the actual predictive modeling. But I want you to click on that. So that was raster, and then it was raster map calculator, and then uh, 
raster map calculator, R map calc. And it looks like this, and it has some symbols that look like a regular map. Um, and what we simply can do in this particular case is to put the number one, and then uh, name for the output map, we can put friction, and we can hit run. And we get a map that fills in the computational region at the same resolution as your SRTM, where if we query it, all the values are going to be one. doesn't matter where we click, right? So that is the absolute simplest way that you could possibly use the map calculator. We're going to get into you know, the power of this map calculator a little later on. But for now, we just made a map, a friction map, where it costs one second to cross, uh, one additional second to cross all of these um, cells. Uh, you know, and then our walk is going to bring in the elevation and the slope and all of that for us in addition to that. The next thing we need to do is to take our uh, vector streams line and make it amenable to what our walk needs as starting points. And there are two ways that we could potentially go about that. So I'm just going to show you our vector stream uh, map again over here. We could extract a series of starting vector points in between or along all the lines and that use those as starting points. But lucky f for us, when we go back to our walk over here, we see we can actually have a name of starting raster points map. So that means if we give it a raster map, uh, if we basically convert the lines into raster cells, then we can start at every point along the stream. And that's probably the most efficient way to do this. So that's what we're going to do. To do that, we're going to go to the file menu. And we're going to find the map type conversions. And then we're going to find vector to raster, or v.2.rast. And this module, uh, because I have the streams already selected, loads up the input vector map. And then we just need to put a name for the output streams raster map. Um, and what we're going to do is to copy that and paste it into there. And instead of vector there, we're going to put raster. Then we have here the source of raster values. Now, if we wanted to, we could pick unique values from the attribute table or the unique category values. Um, but what we're going to do is choose the one that says val. And then I'll just show you down here in the attributes over here. Um, you could potentially uh, pick the column you know, to define the, the number that goes into each raster cell. Now, for our purposes, that's not important. So we're just going to have it be raster value, used for values 1. Could be 0, could be 1,000, doesn't matter for us. We just need to have the points so that we can put them into our walk. So we're going to do that. We're going to hit Run. And um, what we can see is if we close our stream vector points and our friction map, and we have a vector, uh, sorry, a raster map of the streams now that actually mirrors exactly where the vector lines were. And if we zoom in on one of these areas, we can actually see those are individual cells, right? Those are actually raster cells as opposed to the um, vector lines. So we can see how they overlap exactly there. Uh, so at this particular point, um, what we can do is, I'm just going to zoom back out so we're looking at the whole thing again, is go into our R walk again and find our name of starting raster points map and we're going to pick our streams raster we're going to go to the required tab we're going to pick our uh, input elevation raster map as our SRTM from the permanent map set we're going to go to where it says input raster map containing friction costs and we're going to input our friction map where we just have the value of one and then finally we need to give a name so we'll put streams walking costs, okay? And at this point, we're basically ready to go, so we're just going to hit run, and it'll take, you know, more or less time, depending on your computer, and we get this map over here. And this is a map of the, how much time it would take uh, to walk, starting at every point along the stream and just walking away, right? And uh, to make that sort of uh, a little bit more clear, what we can do is to put the streams map on top. And here what I will do is I will style that by coloring it in red, like so. 
So all our streams are there in red. And let's just zoom in to one of these places here. So we can see our streams. And if I get even tighter in like that, we can basically see as we move away from the streams, the colors of our streams walking cost maps start to change. And if we query along one of those trajectories, I'm going to move that just to the side here, we can see the value is 528 seconds there. And as we move away, the value gets bigger and bigger and bigger until places that are far away from the streams have big numbers like 4,835 seconds. And again, our walk outputs the uh, file output cost in terms of walking time in seconds. So you want to convert this to something a little bit more simpler in your mind. Divide this number, 4,835 uh, by 60. Let me get my little calculator tool up here. Put it over here. So uh, 4,835 divided by 60 equals 80.58 minutes. And we can go even further, dividing that by 60 again. That's an hour point thirty four, so one hour, uh, one and a third hours more or less. So that's basically an hour and 20 minutes of walking time from this point to the near stream, which is probably one of these two over here. So that's pretty cool. Let me just uh, zoom back out. Um, what we could do at this point is load on our, uh, you know, archaeological sites like so, and we could run a query on this, and we could upload information, in, you know, from the lo least cost paths map into all the sites. Um, we would have to change back into the permanent map set though, because we cannot alter uh, files that are in permanent map set when we're in a different map set, and we're in a map set we call Project Two. So we'd either have to change back into the permanent map set, or we'd have to make a copy of that map here. And we could do that pretty simply here. We could go to File Manage Map, Copy, and make it Copy. Then we have multiple copies, and maybe we're not interested in all you know 2,000 sites in these uh, in these survey databases. Um, so maybe what we want to do instead is to narrow down in on a time period and a type of site, and then just work with those. And since that's what you're going to have to do in Project 2 and Project 3. Anyway, I'm going to show you basically how we're going to go about doing that. And then I'll show you how to start to query information from various raster maps that we've made, like slope and aspect and this least cost paths map, uh, into the um, database for those selected sites. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hide our walking costs and clean up our view a little bit. So right now all we have visible is our SRTM in the background and our two site databases. Now these site databases have uh, much the same information but only the WHS sites has any information about temporal period. So what I'm going to say is that for project two and three we're going to work with WHS sites as our main um, survey database. So at this particular point, I'm going to turn off the visibility on the North Bank survey sites. So we're just going to work with these sites that I previously colored in red. Now, if you select it, you could right click on it and go down to where it says show attribute data. and It'll bring up the table. But a neat shortcut is this little button up here, show attribute data. And it loads up the table. And this is basically like, you know, a spreadsheet table view of all of your uh, sites over here. And much like in QGIS, you can right click and uh, select a, a, a actual site, which are in rows, and then you can say, highlight that selected feature, and you see it shows up in yellow. You can uh, highlight selected feature and zoom, and it'll zoom into those things. I'm gonna actually now zoom back. Um, and then you can extract that selected feature and what that means is it will make it into a brand new separated vector file where it has just the, only the features that you have highlighted uh, will be in the new vector points file. Now you know if we had to do this one by one or even 
selecting multiple rows. I held down the shift key and selected multiple rows. Um, that would be kind of annoying. We can sort based on a few things, so that could be helpful. Uh, but what we really want to do is uh, something a bit more complicated than that, which is to uh, do a selective search based on actual information in database. Now you'll see up here there's a, a variety of columns and they have titles like max w lnd underscore code site underscore type uh, and then a whole bunch of other weird ones with uh, things like cal ev ev1 etc now all these ones these all these ones at the end are time periods and they're basically binary zero or one whether or not any artifacts from that time period were found at that particular site then that time period will have a 1. If no artifacts were found from that time period at that particular site, it will be a 0. Okay. These other ones uh, at the front are codes for information about the site. Now, in Project 2, when you unloaded it, you had your grass data folder and a folder called Database Codes. And in there, you had three CSV files, which are spreadsheet files you can open up. And so, for example, we can look at the site type code CSV which I have right here. And we have basically the code and the label uh, over here. And so the site type, uh, like for example, the code LTH underscore SCAT stands for a lithic scatter. Uh, DAM stands for a dam. Um, SHD underscore SCAT stands for a shirt scatter, etc., etc., etc. So what you can do is to read through these codes and get a sense of the kinds of sites that may exist. And you can decide what kind of sites you want to query for, right? Are you interested in farm sites or shirt scatters or lithic scatters or whatever, right? Uh, in addition, we have landform codes, which I have over here. And that tells you whether or not the surveyors thought it was a spur, saddle, ridge, isolated hill, top of hill. So that could be something you're interested in. And then finally, we have temporal periods, which uh, tells you uh, more specifically those little column titles for the different time periods, what the actual time period is. So Cal is Calcolithic, EB is Early Bronze Age, EB3 is Early Bronze Age 3. And again, these are based on the surveyor's uh, understanding of like pottery types and stuff like that, right? So. With these little pieces of information at our disposal, we can go ahead and build a query to simply extract out sites that meet, you know, uh, basically that have those specific characteristics, uh, and we can then ignore all the others. And in the Grass Attribute Table Manager, right here we have the SQL query. By default, it's in the simple mode, which lets you pick basically one column and select values to query. So here, just you know, as an example, we can uh, very simply pick a time period. I'm going to pick, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Neolithic kind of a person, so I'm going to pick the pre-pottery Neolithic PPN. And remember, these are binary, zero, no pre-pottery Neolithic artifacts, one, any pre-pottery Neolithics. So I'm going to put one. And hit apply, and right now it has by default selected all the pre pottery Neolithic sites and highlights them over here in the map display by default. Now, if we were only selecting for one thing, one criteria, in this case temporal period, the simple query builder is all we need. But we want to select a time period and a type, right? Or a time period and a landform. So we need to switch over to the builder tab. And we can type directly in here, or we can get a little assistance for building SQL queries with the SQL Builder um, calculator over here. And right now, my one here, for some reason, is not really working. You're supposed to be able to select every column, get all values, and it tells you a list right here of all the, you know, the values in the columns. And that should help you theoretically build your uh, SQL query statement. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to type it directly in here, and I'll work, uh, you know, walk you through how we uh, how we build an SQL query. And this is a, a you know a useful thing for querying any database. It's not just in GIS, but in general. So by default, it's got a little bit uh, of the query already built from you. 
it says select, all caps, star, or asterisk, from, all caps, WHS sites is the name of our database, our vector points uh, table file here. So basically that says select, right, pick all the uh, entries, the rows, so that's what the star is, it basically says it's a wild card, anything, from this database, and then we need to put in our search criteria. So we can type in WHERE, in all caps, that says select anything from WHS sites, WHERE, and then here we can put in a column. So let's put the first one, PPN, and then we'll put the equal sign, 1. So that's basically exactly what we just did in the simple query, but to go forward, we can now put in AND, we could use or if we wanted to be a bit more flexible so we could get PPN sites or PN sites, so all Neolithic, Pottery Neolithic, and Pre-Pottery Neolithic. Um, in this case, we're just going to go ahead for now and say Pre-Pottery Neolithic sites and uh, site, I'm going to type that in correctly, <laughs> site underscore type equals, and I'm going to put quotes uh, I'm going to do lithic scatters, LTH underscore scat, and then I just have to put quotes around that because that's actually the thing that it's searching for. And at this point, I can just hit enter, and I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? Select star from where PPN equals one, and site type, site type equals LTH scat. Unable to select. Give me one second. Let me pause while I. Uh, where's my pause button? Ha! <laughs> Silly Professor Ula forgot that you can't use double quotes, you have to use single quotes. So you see here, I had those kind of quotes, the, 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 the two <laughs> uh, simple quotes. You need just the one. So basically, two apost apostrophe on either side of it. And now when we hit the, oh, sorry, now when I hit enter, it actually selected the things that I want. And now you can see over here on the map display, there are fewer sites selected, right? So in that case, and we can scroll through what we have selected, we basically have only the lithic scatters uh, selected as well. Now, that's the minimum I'm asking you to do for project two, which is to put two variables in there. But you can build this up uh, as much as you want through all of that logic. Um, so here we can go back in here and put an or uh, pn equals one and site type equals lithic scatter. And now we have both pre-pottery neolithic and pottery neolithic sites that are lithic scatters. So we can broaden our temple horizon and we could add in more conditional statements, ands or ors, to narrow down or expand our search criteria as we see fit. So what I'm going to do is to leave this here. So for me, I'm going to have Neolithic sites that are lithic scatters. And now these are all by default highlighted. I can right click up in here and go down to where it says extract selected features. Name for new, new vector map. I'm going to call it Neolithic lithic scatters. And I'm just going to click OK. And there we go. I can at this point close the attribute table. And by default it adds it, but it doesn't uh, make it visible. So I'm going to make it visible. See all these black ones are the sites that we had highlighted before and now we've extracted them. And they are actually a separate, completely and totally different vector points file that's going to be saved in our Project 2 map set. And we won't have to deal with our original WHS sites vector file from here on out. So at this particular point, we can actually remove those from our view so we don't get confused. And we can remove things like our friction map that we don't really need to look at. And we can remove our streams raster that we don't really need to look at. And we're, for the time being, going to leave our streams walking costs and our streams vector in there. But we're going to have them be invisible or unchecked at the time. So let's open up our attribute table again for our newly formed uh, Neolithic Lithic Scatter. And what I want to show you, I'm just going to expand this thing 
to be full screen and move me down over here. We have um, quite a few uh, columns now that are not particularly useful for us anymore. Basically, all the dating stuff, all these columns at the end here, I mean, they're not going to help us because we've uh, basically said we don't care about any of that information. We queried for PN and PPN. We also don't really care about um, the site type uh, anymore as well. So what we can do is to go over to the tab down here that says Manage Table. Uh, and we can select, I'm just going to click on the first temporal period. Then I'm going to scroll to the very bottom, hold down the Shift key, and click again, and see that all those temporal columns are selected. I'm going to right click on it and say Drop Selected Column going to say, oh, do you really want to do that? And we're going to say yes. And it's going to take a little bit because the database stuff takes some time. We're going to just wait for a little bit. And uh, when that's done, we can then click on our site type column. You know, you don't have to do this, but let's drop that one as well. Yes. Okay. So we go back to browse data, and now we have much fewer columns to deal with. And I want to stress that what we just did is permanent. You can't bring those columns back once you delete them, so you better be pretty sure you want to delete them uh, before you actually do it. But in our case, what we really want to do is to add a couple of new columns, because we're going to now query some of those raster maps and bring that data inside. So back on the Manage Tables, um, tab down here. At the bottom we can say add column and let's get columns for our slope, our aspect, and our streams walking cost. So all we do is to put in a name and we have to be careful because this database stuff they're very very strict about the naming the way you name columns. No spaces, don't start with numbers, and try and keep the names of the columns as short as possible because it will get truncated after something like 12 or 14 characters. So we can just write uh, slope and I'm doing it, that one in all caps and I'm going to make this small again so you can see it and we want to choose whether it's an integer whole numbers or double or string or dates and in our case here double right and then we're going to add and you see down here added slope and now we're going to put aspect and we're going to leave that double add and we've added aspect and now we can have something like sperm costs right we're making this short and we're going to add that and we can see that here now back on the browse data tab you can see we have these new columns they're blank there's no information in them that's what we're going to do at this particular uh, next step. We're going to query those raster maps at the location of each of these sites that we've selected out. And we're going to pull that information and put it into this database table. So let's start with uh, adding in our, we don't have to do this. We don't have to look at it, but I'm going to just explain to use this to explain to you why. So we're going to add in our SRTM slope that we created last time. And we're going to basically uh, zoom in on it. Now the colors are different. I'm going to change the colors of our um, vector points map. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them be uh, filled white circles. Okay, so now we can see these guys over here. And in the map display, let me move my webcam off to the side. I'm just going to zoom in to uh, one of them right here. Okay, so this particular site is located on a pixel that is of slope. Oops, I had to select the slope map over here. Then my query tool. And the slope is 19 degrees, or 19.13844 degrees, right? So what we were going to do is to automatically do this kind of query when I click this pixel near this point. We're going to have the GIS click all the pixels, save that information, and put it into the table over here in this column called slope that we created. To do that, 
we go up to the vector menu item and we go down to where it says update attributes and we find the one where it says sample raster maps at point locations v dot what dot rast and there's a bunch of other ones in here including ones to do with polygons and querying one vector with another vector but what we want to do is to query a raster map at the location of a vector points map v what rast the vector points map which we want to edit or add the attributes to is our Neolithic lithic scatters that we just created. And uh, the existing raster map to be queried is our slope map that we have here in the background. And here under the optional tab, we have to choose the name of the column to update. And we're going to go down and select the slope column that we just added to that database table. And we can hit go now. I just want to say that what we're going to do by default is to query just that pixel or those pixels that are directly underneath the points. We can get a little bit of an averaging by this interpolate values from the nearest four cells. So it would basically go and get the average slope in this sort of pixel size of 3 by 3 basically around it. So what we're going to do is just leave it alone for now. We're going to hit run. It's going to say 84 records updated. There were 84 sites, so that's good. And then over here in the uh, table, we just hit refresh, and we can see that there is data now in our slope column. And right down here, 19.334, that is uh, that particular point that we happen to have actually zoomed in there. So we can actually see that the value of that pixel got pulled in into this row and this column right here. So this particular site along this row and slope along the column. Now we can continue with VWAT RAST. We can go back to the required tab. We can now go in and pick our aspect map. Go back to the optional tab. Go in here and pick aspect as our column. Hit run and go back here. Hit refresh again and now we have data in our aspect column. And again we're going to go back to VWAT RAST. Go back to the required tab, uh, raster map streams walking cost, optional tab, pick the column that says uh, a street strum cost that we made, hit run, 84 records updated, refresh the table, and that data is in here now. And so now what we have here is a list of the time it takes to walk from all of those sites to whichever section of the stream is closest according to human walking ability. Okay? And you can see there's some variation inside this uh, column. So what we could do is to just visually look at this stuff. But let's calculate some statistics across all the values that are in this column. And to do that, what we're going to do is to go to Vector Menu, and we're going to go down to Reports and Statistics, and we're going to go down to where it says univariate attribute statistics uh, for columns, v.db.univer. And we're going to select our Neolithic lithic scatters, and we're going to select our STRM costs, and we can do this with slope and aspect as well. And then at the end, what we'll do, we could check out some of these things, but we can just hit run. And here it's going to tell us the minimum value in that column was 70 seconds. The maximum value is uh, 2,491 seconds. The range is you know, 2,421. The mean value, the average value, is uh, 1,099 seconds. And the standard deviation is plus or minus 675 seconds. So those two are probably the most interesting ones for us, the mean and standard deviation. And what you can do is um, get your calculator up on your phone or on the computer and just change those things into minutes or hours. So let's do it for minutes. So what we can do is to grab uh, this number, we can highlight it, right click, copy, paste it into our calculator and divide by 60. So we would write down 18 and a third minutes, so uh, 18 minutes and 20 seconds or so is the average walking time between one of our Neolithic lithic scatters and its nearest stream. And then we can calculate the standard deviation in minutes. We can right click, copy, paste it in here, 
divide by 60 and uh, we get what did I do here oh <laughs> did I copy the thing again okay I didn't paste the right value into the copy paste divide by 60 11 right so actually what we have is 18 minutes plus or, plus or minus 11 minutes so we actually have a pretty wide spread in our in our information over here so sites are located within generally speaking most sites are located within about 30 minutes walk from stream although some are located as close as a 10 minute walk from stream and on average they're located around about a 20 minute walk to the stream so that's actually a kind of an interesting little finding there something i didn't actually know about this data set until i tried to do this um, this exactly right here and just to show you we can pick any uh you know any column we want and calculate values so here we just did slope the average slope is about eight degrees plus or minus uh six degrees so there's actually quite a bit of variation in local slope um, the last thing I'll say here is that you can choose uh, to change the scale at your analysis. So remember we did that slope. This is using uh, our slope aspect, but we did slope with our param scale and we did uh, slope at a 9 by 9 and that gives us very different values. So we could replace the uh, value of slope at, that we calculated v what rast we can go back here to the required tab and we can pick our slope 9 by 9 and we can go back in here and we can select our slope column again and hit run and now we've just overwritten those values and you see how they change when I hit refresh now and now when we hit uh, VDB uh, Univare we're going to get a whole suite of different numbers the average larger scale slope is now closer to seven degrees with a standard deviation of only five degrees. So again, that's why the scale of analysis kind of matters. And you have to decide at which scale you want to query. Is the local slope just across the pixel where the person holding the GPS met? Does that, is that what mattered to the people? Or did the slope over a broader area, the nearest three or six or nine cells, so a much bigger region, is that the reason what you know that people were thinking about when they chose to put their site in that place. So with that I'm going to conclude today's practicum and again we're going to build on all this stuff as we go forward um, through project two and into project three. Um, see y'all later in class.